அருள் வேறு நீ வணிங்க You can put admit all. Yeah, I'm trying that. <clears throat> there's no admit all, interestingly. Don't know why. Why does it not admit all? Enable, enable waiting. Oh, no. No, it it just show managed participants. Okay, here we go. There we go. Yeah. Wow, a lot of people. Yes. Here we go. So we actually we can actually start now, everybody. Good morning. Good morning to everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning. Let's let's be on time. Yes, it's great to see you all. Um, I would like to start acknowledging the traditional owners of the land which we meet here today and all the other lands from all you are. Um, and here is the Galiga people, their own nation. Um, it's my welcome to all of you. It's really great to see the dedications of teachers in principle to your language and your community. It's a Saturday morning in a school holidays and you're all here in your time to, to get something new. Very exciting for us. Um, today, the New South Wales Federation <coughs> brings you the opportunity to learn from three distinguished um, representative persons that are really going to bring you something very very interesting for you all. We have from the live from the States, we have Dr. Joy Payton. She is the co-founder and president of the Coalition of Community-Based Heritage Language Schools and a senior fellow of the Center for Applied Linguistics in Washington, DC. We also have <laughs> Dr. Tommy Lu. He has worked closely with community-based Chinese heritage language schools and organization for over 20 years. He's now seen serving as a core team member and a language representative with the coalition of community-based heritage language schools. You see Dr. Joy and Dr. Tommy Lu working together, uh, which includes the all heritage languages in the United States. And also from somewhere here in Australia, we have Professor of Education, Professor Ken Cruikshank, which also is going to present with the Australian perspective. Um, it's great to see you all here in our uh, online virtual conference. Um, in, no, we couldn't have it, just here, we couldn't organize one face to face, but it's on your plans. But it's also, no, it doesn't, it's not important for us. It's important that we still continue to provide a very good service for all members. Um, you see, last year, COVID wasn't, in, wasn't a problem for us. We had over 5,000 registrations, over 50 professional development opportunities for our teachers and members. So you, we are always striving to provide the best for you, for all community members here. And, Thank you so much. I hope you really enjoyed this morning. And now I'm going to give you a pass to Alex. I'm going to say a few words. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank Lucia. You. So, um, Lucia, uh, um, we uh, just want to reiterate um, from, from the president of the Federation of Community Language Schools, uh, our sincere gratitude to our speakers. Um, it's uh, it's uh, just after 7 p.m. in uh, in the United States, where they where they are uh, where they are at the moment, and um, and uh, they've uh, they've been busy with other conferences, um, very very involved in heritage languages or community languages, as we call them here. So, uh, without further ado, could I also just please uh, remind everybody to turn your cameras off. Uh, we will uh, we are recording this session for those of you who might want to uh, refer to it later on. Your microphones need to be off as well, just for protocol reasons, and. Uh, 
Joy and, uh, and Tommy will be uh, giving you some indications as to how to um, ask any questions. It's basically going to be going through the chat. This is our first session. It'll go for about an hour or so. After that, there'll be a break. And then the second session with, uh, with uh, uh, Professor Ken. So without further ado, over to our main speakers and we will disappear for a moment out of view. Okay. Enjoy everybody. Enjoy Thank everybody. you. So it looks like we lost uh, Joy. So Joy, are you... Uh... Have a look. Is, I don't see Joy come up. No, she's there. Oh, no, she's in the waiting room now. She's in the waiting room for some reason. Yeah. She's joining me again. Technical issues, people. It's what happens when it's live from, uh, from the United States. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Hi, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> It's part of our live conference. It always something could happen. Oh, hey, Ken! Hi. Um, so, she, oh, is it time for us to start? And yes. you're waiting for me, or where are we? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, I am uh, Joy Payton. Thank you very much, Alex and Lucia, for um, having us. It's wonderful to be with all of you, and it's wonderful to be with you, Ken. Also. And let's just hope I don't get kicked out again. But if I do, Tommy, can you continue? I hope I don't. Okay, let's just let's just not assume that. Okay. So, um, can you see my screen? Yes. Good. Okay. So please let me know. Good. If there are any issues as we go forward. So, I'm Joy Payton, and I'm president of the Coalition of community-based heritage language schools. And I'm here with Tommy Liu, and he is also with the coalition. I think you'd like to know that Tommy is founder of the Chinese School of Delaware. He has worked with community-based Chinese schools for over 20 years, and he's an advisor to the Washington Metropolitan Association of Chinese Schools. And I know that some of you hold positions like that as well. So we're going to talk some about these schools and the things that we do in these schools. And we're hoping to have a chance to learn about some of your activities and thoughts. So in the United States, there are thousands of community-based heritage language schools across the country, teaching hundreds of languages really throughout the history of the country. Joshua Fishman, who was passionate about these schools, identified over 1,800 in the 1960s and over 6,500 in the 1980s. And in 2001, at a conference that we held, the second National Heritage Language Conference in California, he said that if we define heritage languages as languages other than English that have relevance to learners, we will find schools teaching these languages in indigenous, what he called colonial, which are French, Spanish, countries like that, German, and immigrant groups throughout this country's history. All the references where I have uh, citations on the slides, all the references are on the last two slides. So a survey of these schools has not been conducted since Joshua Fishman did that in the 1980s. And it's probable that there are many more schools now, although many are struggling during this period of COVID restrictions and trying to figure out their next steps as I imagine you all are too. So at this point, we have documented nearly 400 schools teaching 37 languages, and here are the languages, sorry to go so fast, in 35 states, and we have a map of where those schools are and that's online and you'll see a link to that later. Now, it's my understanding that you all have schools teaching 80 languages on, in Australia and around 60 in New South Wales. And you are way ahead of us in, if this is true and these are the languages and you know them, you're way ahead of us in knowing how many languages are taught because we don't know the total number. We're just 
going little by little, there are, there are way more than 37 languages being taught in this country. So now Tommy is gonna to talk about characteristics of these schools, some of their characteristics that we found in the survey. And while he talks, think about your schools and how they're the same and how they're different from what Tommy describes. Okay, so thank you, Joy. Um, so the next slide, uh, I'm going to present some of the uh, data we have collected uh, from uh, our end. So we have conducted the survey for a couple of years now. Uh, so you can see uh, based on what we have collected. Now, first I want to uh, mention that the community-based schools in the United States, they are very shy. They are very difficult to, uh, to reach. Uh, they, are very, uh, they are very busy because they are run by volunteers. So we try our best to collect as, as much data as we could. So you can see from the locations, you can see uh, all these schools, uh, they are uh, all over the place. They, they, they probably use the private schools, the facilities, church, uh, public school facilities, library, community center. Uh, so you can see uh, they all spread out. Uh, these uh, programs, uh, of course, are, run, are running by the volunteers, the native speakers. Uh, and uh, they are running on weekends uh, or afternoons as an after-school program. So you can see um, uh, uh, not very high percentage of the programs are run every day. Most of them run on weekends. And uh, uh, then most schools run about three hours. Uh, very few of them are run more than five hours a week. So uh, these, uh, next slide, please. All right, so these are the, uh, uh, the students, the population of students. You can see a majority of the community-based schools, their students are heritage learners, meaning they are probably uh, come from an Im immigrant family or first or second generation uh, families. Uh, although some of the uh, community-based schools have transformed into a different uh, track, they are uh, attracting more world language uh, programs into these community-based schools, primarily because the public schools or charter school or private schools do not offer them. We often call them less commonly taught languages. Uh, so next one. Okay, so these are the uh, uh, grade levels. You can see a majority of them are probably in the elementary school level from uh, preschool to the uh, eighth grade. And there are some schools from all the way to the 12th grade. And uh, there are over a hundred uh, some programs also offer adult uh, programs. So we try to build this uh, 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 pipeline and uh, in parallel with the uh, public schools. Now many community-based schools they, are, they also offer uh, standardized tests. Uh, the, of course, the AP exams are the most popular one because that gives students uh, credits uh, for college. And uh, right now, uh, community-based schools are also approaching the uh, um, CLO biliteracy or global CLO um, certificates. Many states in the United States also recognize these two uh, certifications. So students receive these, they can either get a high school foreign language credits or uh, college credits. Some of the exams also uh, can be honored by home countries, meaning that the, uh, the language uh, they're, uh, they're, they're speaking, the government of that language will also honor a credit. So if they want to go back to study, like I know what uh, German, uh, German schools, uh, they are offering the, uh, uh, the home country level of proficiency exams. So a student can go back to Germany and continue their study in Germany. Okay, next one. Yeah, that's just showing, we just tell people yeah. to contact Tommy if they're documenting, but we're do only documenting schools in the United States. So. <laughs> And then just. 
Okay, so I think uh, we believe that these schools can make significant contributions uh, to the language learning enterprise in this country. If they are recognized and there is a collaboration between them and the public, private and charter schools. Um, so this will be very helpful. So there is a America's Languages uh, Initiative uh, we also uh, collaborate with. Uh, so if there are more opportunities, we can uh, um, elaborate that a little bit more. So now I'm gonna turn it back to Joy. Thank you, Tommy, thank you. So that just gives you a, kind of an overview of our schools. Um, and I'd love to hear about yours, but we're thinking about time. Um, so I want to talk about this capacity building opportunity creation and desire enhancement, because these are pretty important things. A number of years ago, Joe Lobianco and Francois Grin, and some of you might know them, Joseph Lobianco, they developed a framework for determining the vitality of a language in a community or a country. And then more recently, Joe and I applied this framework to thinking about the vitality of heritage languages in the lives of individuals, their families, and their communities. And I just want to take a look at that now. So as you, all of us here are involved in capacity building, the first thing on the list, that is, and that's what Tommy's been talking about, capacity building, developing the language proficiency and cultural knowledge of students in our schools. And the goal in schools in the United States is that students will begin to participate early, some as young as two years old, continue to participate and develop their heritage, language, and cultural knowledge throughout high school and into higher education in the workplace and become fully bilingual and highly proficient. And Tommy talked about earning the seal of biliteracy, being able to take these high level exams. So what are some of the ways that we do this, that we build, seek to build capacity? So first of all, engaging students and their families throughout elementary, middle, and high school through effective, engaging instruction, cross-grade art articulation, creating pathways from novice to advanced proficiency levels and resulting in high levels of proficiency and recognition of that proficiency, which is what we're really working on now because it's not um, going all that well yet. So now just to mention a few approaches that we in the US and other countries are engaging in to build capacity. Now, you all are probably doing some of these same things and in a few minutes, we'll ask if there are other ways that you build capacity in addition to the ones I mentioned. But singing, dancing, movement, play-based learning. And I'll just say that there are some really, really good videos on 51 Talk of students working in play-based learning situations with teachers working with students. Reading with and not to children, both at school and at home. Having lots of books available in the language, which is sometimes often a challenge. Out of school activities, best if it's a collaboration between parents and teachers. Tutoring and mentoring by teenagers and time spent in the home country. I was just in a conference today and somebody was talking about uh, this tutoring and mentoring of middle school students working with elementary school students online, tutoring them. And in their school, they have 300 pairs that are working on this. The children love it, the middle school students love it and you can imagine the parents love it too to have their well there are there are cautions i know people mentioned the, the the cautions which i think they're following but still it's a it's a very very engaging activity and of course time spent in the home country many people do that so um students and parents engaging in fun activities together um modern law you probably some of you probably know it in iceland I, I mentioned having books available. They have a large library with books in over 50 languages that are available for children and adults across the country. So I think that's wonderful and that they make that um, known to people. And then of course, uh, holding cultural events and all the many, many cultural events that schools are engaging in and 
engaging students in so many different ways. We could talk about cultural events, you know, for the rest, the rest of the night. Um, and then older learners. Now that's often a challenge because by the time students get to middle and high school, they want to drop out. They have other things to do. They have piano, sports, et cetera. Um, but what are, what are people doing to engage them in capacity building or middle high school? Project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, time spent in home country, again, tutoring, mentoring, mentoring young learners, receiving mentoring and tutoring by others. And there's a video about that of a student receiving mentoring from an older student who has much more experience, interacting with professionals who use the language um, at work, visiting organizations and centers where the language is used and they can see people using it. So project-based learning, you're probably pros at project-based learning, but just get us on the same page that all of the activities, conversations and writing are around a theme um, that we hope is engaging and developmentally appropriate, authentic, addresses a real, real world problem we're working in the real world. And we have a, on our website, we have a discussion of project-based learning with some projects there. So possible themes that we've worked on, po popular music, sports, career plans, um, Maria Carrera and Olga Pagan, who are leaders in the United States, um, worked with students on why we speak, use, and learn the language. What are our reasons? And there are the reasons that they and the students worked out together. And then they build projects around that. This, is, this always results in a project and it results in a presentation. So here is a result, here's a presentation at the end of project-based learning in a Hindi school, for example. Inquiry-based learning is like, very much like project-based learning, but as you know, the, the desire is to get students very engaged in their own learning. So the students help to pick the topics and the themes that they're interested in. They can choose a focus, consider what we wanna know, well, how are we gonna learn, how are we gonna explore, and how are we gonna present it? The students are very involved in making those decisions. So, and this is also in resources for teachers. A group of us, including Tommy, took a course, a university course on inquiry-based learning, and it was really, really fun. And we developed units using inquiry-based learning for elementary school, middle school, and high school. And those are also on our webpage. So all of these are links. And when you all have the slides, if you're interested, you can look them up. Um, <clears throat> also, I mentioned before, well, I don't know if I mentioned, but having professionals uh, visit the school. So here, this is the French school in New York City, and they bring in ambassadors from various French-speaking countries to meet and talk to the students so that they get to interact with leaders who speak the language. Also, um, Ashok Oja, who you would love him, he, he works in the Hindi program. I was with him and he was holding a conversation with high school students and professionals who use Hindi in their careers. And they were talking, the students were asking them questions, but the professionals were talking about what they do with the Hindi language. So here's a question for you. What are some ways uh, that you build capacity um, language proficiency and cultural knowledge. Um, I, could you write some of those ways in the chat? Um, and Tommy, I can't see the chat. Can you? Or am I taking up the whole screen? Uh, I know what I can, can do. You see that from the side. If you uh, click, click the, uh, the chat on the bottom. Yeah, well, my, my slides are taking up the whole screen. Oh, do you I have see. Uh, do you have room? Uh, do, yeah, do you see? Yes. So far, I have not seen Can any questions. Can you read questions. some of them? I have not seen any, see any questions reactions. posted for this uh, for this one. Build capacity. Okay. Or oh, role play no, drama. I mean, this is ah ah lovely, lovely role play Very, drama. Yes. Yeah, Thank role you. Role play drama. Good. 
Okay. Well, I'll bet that you all have so many ways that you build capacity and we could add to our list um, by interacting with you, but let's go on to opportunity creation. So sometimes we focus all our attention on capacity building. After all, we're in school, we're supposed to be building proficiency. We have goals for proficiency, the one, some of the ones that Tommy was, um, was talking about. Um, passing these exams, getting to this point, receiving this uh, award. But Joe Bianco claims that capacity is essential, of course. The more capacity or proficiency we have, the more opportunities we have to use the language. We can, we can go to more places and use the language more. But capacity alone is not sufficient. We, somebody needs to be muted. We have... We, we need opportunities where using the language is not optional, but rather essential. Um, so real circumstances and domains for genuine use of the language. Places and circumstances where use of the language is natural, welcome, and not only that, but expected. And these opportunities can be in informal settings, informal settings, rural communication, outside of school. So these are some interesting questions about opportunity. What opportunity do the students that you work with have to use the language? How extensive, rich, and complex are these opportunities? Who chooses to participate in them? How and in what ways and to what extent do they participate? Why, for what purposes, and with what outcomes? Anybody have something you'd like to put in the chat? We would unmute you, but I think that would be, it would be difficult. So unfortunately, you just have to write in the chat. But I'd love to hear some of your answers to these questions. Uh, I see one say, tell them about our culture, traditions, in acting customs, weekly news speech, and writing research paper on certain topics. Uh, mm, yes. Swedish school. Yes, that's giving a, them an opportunity. Yeah, and uh, Swedish yeah. school has a generous donor who has given a scholarship. Oh, good. Okay. Well, that goes and on. then, then a very good question, a, a good question on that one is who participates in that scholarship program? Who gets the scholarship? Are these students who are motivated? What is their motivation? Just so many interesting questions to ask. And the last thing in this list of capacity building, opportunity creation, and desire enhancement is desire. And that is, so Joe LoBianco, back to him, because this is his framework. He claims that although capacity and opportunities are essential, they're not sufficient. Desire is also critical. Why do I want to use and develop my proficiency in this language? Why? For what purposes? You probably know people who have the capacity and have many opportunities to use a language and they do not have a desire to use it for a number of reasons and they don't use it. I'll bet you know people like that. So, but some of the reasons are that might create desire is that proficiency in the language can bring certain rewards. Use of the language can be a component of our identity. It can promote association with and participation with com communities of speakers. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, um, with this framework, but Gardner and Lambert, and they are in the, um, in the references and their name is on the slide too. It's just that you can't see it because it's covered up at the top, but they came up with instrumental reasons, economic advantages, professional opportunities, buying power, academic or workforce success, personal connections with family, with community, an integral sense of identity, engagement with the culture, inspiration by, uh, by celebrities. 
I showed this to one set of parents and they said, you know, I've only ever thought about personal and that is connections with family. I actually never thought of those other desires or uh, motivations. So now Tommy is gonna show you, um, and I'm gonna show some nine different slides while you talk, Tommy, just to illustrate different ways that our schools are working to build desire. So Tommy, okay. you just say what you want and I'll show the slides. <laughs> All right, so, can, so uh, how do we build a desire? Well, uh, I want to uh, mention a couple of things. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, I'm not sure about in uh, Australia, but in the United States, um, the community-based schools, the best value or the best kept secrets, uh, one is they have very rich cultural activities uh, and events. And uh, they are so rich that I don't think the regular school, the main school, mainstream school system will be able to afford. I cannot speak for many other languages, but for, let's say for Chinese school, for example, a lot of Chinese school, they have a folk dance, they have those props, costumes, they have a lion, they can perform lion dance, dragon dance. Uh, they have, we're, we're, after all I'm showing you the puppet show. So we can provide these rich cultural experiences to, to, to many students, not just uh, for the uh, uh, heritage learners. So to build the uh, desire, first one is we try to build a dynamic, engaging community within and outside the school. So, so it has to be built two ways. The, uh, from within the community-based schools, they have to be willing to outreach to the community, uh, which they have done, and to the main school system to support uh, this, the, uh, the, the, the language, world language program. But at the same time, from the mainstream school system, they also uh, need to show some desire to seek support from these community-based schools. Uh, often I, I, I see these two are not making a very good, solid, strong connections. Uh, it's like uh, uh, the, uh, a lot of main, mainstream school systems, they are, they are teaching the school like, like a silo. And the mentory has its own focus, middle school has its own focus, high school has its own focus. They only worry about the academic performance and achievements, but they are missing a lot of uh, cultural uh, experiences. The other one for community-based schools, the desire will actually come from the identity. Community-based schools bring to this, uh, uh, in this, this community, the sense of belonging of those heritage learners. Now they have a place they probably look alike. Their parent probably speaks something other than English. So identity and the cultural experience, I think are the most valuable uh, assets for the community-based schools. Okay, Joy. And then Tommy, oh, oh, also, as Tommy mentioned before, um, a second thing, thank you, Tommy, is awarding students for the language proficiency they develop. So for us in the United States, it's the global seal and the state seal of biliteracy and the test that, Sean, uh, that Tommy showed you. And then once you've earned that to get recognition, so you can see the Bulgarian School of Seattle is really uh, pulling out the students who have received these, uh, these seals and making them visible. This student had received two seals. <laughs> we need to have him come and talk to us. Here's another seal and who and what the seal looks like, the certificate, and then these students too. So, so being awarded. And another, uh, and, and I'm sure you all have the ways that you do it too. Another way to build desire is to build collaboration with public, private, and charter schools so that students don't feel so alone to promote student engagement and proficiency, informing the public schools about activities and instructions in community-based schools. So long, way in the beginning of these slides, you saw some Chinese students doing a, a performance and Tommy School takes those performances into the public schools and the public schools don't have, always have the capacity to do that kind of performance. So the community-based schools go there and that's, that builds desire because students feel connected, they're making contributions, they're connecting with other cultural organizations 
and sometimes collaborating internationally, and they're having a sense of themselves as global citizens. So just maybe a couple of you have put this in the chat. What are some ways that you build desire in the students you work with? I'll tell you in the in the in a Brazilian school here, one way that they build desire in the high school students is that the high school students go in and they teach the elementary school students. So they have their own class, their own group meeting, and then they go to the elementary school classes and they teach them and they're very engaged in that. Tommy, do you see any uh, any comments? Uh, no, but I think Nina brought up a very good point about the. Uh, uh, culture. Uh, she said uh, teaching language without the culture is like swimming in the air. So I think mm. uh, the cultural component mm. is extremely valuable and important uh, for the community-based schools. Yes. Now I see yes, a lot of... Yes, uh, thank you, Nina. Uh, okay, a lot. A lot. I could, I could not keep up. We'll read a couple. Okay, students visiting yeah. parents, countries, or of origin. So they, they go, they, uh, they yes. visit their home country. Uh, they also yes. work with the embassy, like a Swedish embassy. Mm. Uh, they they mm -hmm. are teaching uh, uh, cultural dancing, folk dancing, uh, connecting them to the culture through songs and dance. Okay. Yeah, like a song, dance, and yeah. a role play. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, uh, okay. for Chinese yeah. school, we have a summer camp, and in summer camps, we usually have to recruit uh, summer camp counselors, and the qualification of counselors has to be high school students, and uh, these high school students, mm -hmm. they were actually attendees of summer camp in the past, so that kind of uh, built a desire for the younger campers, because they look up to their uh, counselors and that uh, they tell themselves one day I will become a counselor if I keep coming to the summer camp. So actually we never had any issues of uh, recruiting summer camp counselors or assistant counselors. So that's kind of a desire for, for, for our campers. Mm, yes, oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for mentioning that, yes. Um, so if it's okay, Tommy, is it okay to go do you sure. think, or is there something else? Okay, so just to just to conclude, we don't want to take too much of your time, and you you get to list the can next. Um, the I think, although I'm not sure, I think that the coalition of community-based heritage language schools is probably similar in many ways to the federation of community language of community language schools in Australia, and we're so happy to be connected with you. Our goal, we have four goals, to facilitate communication and information and resource sharing among community-based, among the schools. And why I didn't make a slide for this, I don't know. Second, to increase visibility and recognition of these schools within the US education system on local, state, and national levels. I have a feeling that your schools have a much higher level of visibility and recognition than ours do. We're really, really working on it. Third, to document places where heritage language teaching and learning are taking place in these schools by collecting data about the schools. And we showed you the data that we have and we continue. And someday we wanna document all of the schools teaching all of the languages. That would be so wonderful. And then finally, Press for inclusion of these data in US education statistics, because we showed you a report before about America's languages. There was one page where one community-based school was mentioned. That report was all about public, private, and charter schools. And so we would like our data to be included in the national statistics. So in order to do this, we have a number of groups that work together. 
First of all, the coalition core team, and Tommy and I are both members of that team. There's the list, and you can see the different languages that are represented. And then we realized that we definitely cannot make these connections and do all these things ourselves. There's just no way. So we now work with language representatives who um, representing 35 languages at this point, who reach out to their schools, make connections, make sure their schools are on our newsletter. And those, those are listed, those language representatives, there's a, a link to them on our website, their bios and photos. And then we showed you this map before, documenting the schools, keeping a map of them, keeping in touch with those schools. They're, the schools themselves are part of our network, as you know. So just to, to let you know where you can find us, here is our webpage, the coalition webpage, and our Facebook page. And we, uh, I think that, um, that Alex has probably already told you, we have a conference coming up. October 8 to 9, and we have both US and international groups participating in it because of because we're online a lot, primarily online now. And so you're welcome to participate in our conference. Um, here's the web page for the conference. And um, if you would like to be on our mailing list to get notifications about the conference, there is the link at the bottom of our um, of this this slide. And all you do is go to our website and you go to about us and down at the bottom, it says newsletter. And you can just very, very easily sign up and then you'll get notifications about the conference and about other things that we are doing. And um, if you wanna connect with us in any way, there are our emails. So I'll just let you know that these are the references to everything I mentioned in case you're interested in that. But um, do you, wow, Tommy, look at, we're so efficient. It's only quarter of eight. I hope everybody's happy about that. Um, but at this point, is questions, discussion, points you want to make, things we didn't even think about that we need to know that you'd like to say. We have a few minutes. And Okay, I saw uh, two uh, comments, uh, one uh, from uh, Mickey. Uh, surprised that the uh, Swedish is not part of the heritage schools in the USA. Well, no, Swedish is part of the uh, heritage uh, school in the United States. However, we couldn't find any. They are, uh, we used to have uh, several uh, schools uh, that mm. uh, teach Swedish, but we found out they are not community-based because our focus mm. uh, is community-based schools. So we are looking for all the community-based schools uh, for the Swedish schools. Uh, the other one is about Dutch. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, we, uh, we Dutch. don't have any, any Dutch yet. Uh, like I said, in the United States, community-based schools, they are, uh, they are not very uh, open to public. Uh, except for very few schools. That's why uh, we have established this coalition. One of the missions of the coalition is to reach out to those community-based schools because we want to include them. We want to hear their stories and we want to include them in our data collection so we can advocate for, for these schools and also be included in the national statistics. So if you know any Swedish schools, yes. Dutch schools in the United States, please do let us know. Let, please let us know, please connect us with them. Thank you for mentioning that. Thank you so much. I mean, we only recently connected with Bulgarian schools. That was a recent connection. We're very happy with Hungarian schools. It just, as Tommy said, it's not easy for us. I know that you all have federal support for this, is the word federal, a good word for, yes, national support for this, and we don't, but yes, please help us to make those connections. And let us know there's our um, email. Tommy, is there any, any other question or comment? Or are you writing to somebody? 
Yeah, I'm gonna try to uh, respond to uh, about Swedish school. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure there are Swedish schools and we would love to connect with them. And I'm sure there are Dutch schools, we would love to connect with them. Tommy, is it, are there any other comments, um, questions? Yeah, so uh, uh, Pranella, yes, please. If you know any US Swedish community-based schools, please let us know. We will outreach to them. Yes. We will include them. We want to include them. Uh, want okay, so to. Thank I you. think one question is, uh, how do we define community-based school? Okay, uh, so Joy, you want to uh, answer that question? Yeah, a good question. And you know, thank you for asking that. I we have a definition on our website and I usually um, include it and I didn't. Tommy, you help me if I, I'll give a stab and you add to it. Okay. It is a school that operates outside of the public, private and charter school system. So it's an independent school often founded and run by community members, very often parents because they want a school for their children. Um, the language, the language is taught in the school. That's the chief language and culture. That is the chief focus of the school. Um, and as, as Tommy showed you, they range from young children to all the way up to adults. Does that answer? Oh, I, I should say another thing about these schools. They're often, they are self-funded. We don't receive government funding for community-based schools. And so often the funding comes from tuition, sometimes from a foundation that, um, that supports the language, sometimes not often from the home country or from umbrella organizations for that language. Tommy, did I do get it or is there more to say? Yes, yeah. So just like Joy yeah. said, uh, yeah, these schools, they are not part of the, uh, uh, we probably call the mainstream education systems. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, so they do not receive like a, a federal state or like a, like a school district funding. Uh, so they are, they, they, they must survive by themselves. So they are uh, owned by the community, run by the community, and uh, uh, the students come from the community. So, and uh, although this is not uh, 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 required, but majority of the community-based schools in the United States, they, uh, they do not like uh, have like a so-called accreditation either, okay? So right. there is a gray area uh, we struggled with how about a public school or a private school or a charter school? They run a language program as an after-school program. Do we count it as community-based or not? So right, it's, right. we did have that struggle and uh, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a very gray area because mm -hmm. uh, we do not include that as a community-based school if they receive money uh, from the uh, state or local government. But if, if another, right. uh, like uh, for example, the Chinese school, they will go in and rent the school facility, but completely financially independent from the school, yes, we count it as a community-based school. Yes. And, um, and Tony, thank you for bringing up accreditation because um, often the proficiency that the students have from the school and their experience in the school is not recognized at all in the public school. In fact, I used to go to conferences and talks about English language learners. We call them English language learners and how they're doing in school and who they are. And I would stand up and I would say, do you realize that many of these students who you're calling English language learners have another educational profile? 
they may have university level proficiency in their language, because I know some students who do German, Hindi. They're not only English they language learners. They, 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 sorry, what is, can, can you say that again? I think that's, that was Maria. Oh, Maria, and what did she say? I, I didn't catch it. Okay, oh, okay. so sorry, I, th uh, I think the uh, 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 Xiu Mei Liao, uh, she asked, uh, is community school program work with the university exchange student program? Uh, no, if this is the exchange student program, we do not consider a community-based school program. But sometimes there are collaborations, Tommy. We can Some collaborate. Schools do collaborate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. collaborate. Yeah. But uh, if you don't yeah. have a but so no. a because normally it's just an exchange program. It's not a school. So it's not financially mm -hmm. uh, independent from the university. Okay. okay. Look like, um, well, I hope I didn't miss anything. Okay. Do you advertise yourself so that underrepresented language schools find you? Uh, good question. Yes, uh, it's like a, it's like a, a a a single man looking for a single woman to get married. <laughs> so, <laughs> My gosh. so where where is Mr. Wright or Mrs. or or Miss Wright? Yes, I think it comes to two, uh, two ways. We, we try everything. We have website, uh, we use conferences, Facebook. Uh, we use uh, Facebook, Twitter. try to outreach. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the community-based schools also have, you know, have to play equal active role because I'm not sure about yes. uh, Australia, but in the United States, majority of the community-based schools they do not want to outreach for some reason. I couldn't figure out why. Uh, they are kind of shy and they're always busy. And busy, busy. Yeah, I guess because they are you know, around very tight budget, almost no budget. Uh, the principles uh, change very often, maybe one year uh, as a term, maybe two year term, three year term. Uh, so, uh, and so principals always looking for uh, the teachers that they have a very high uh, a turnover rate. Uh, so they are, they are they're already busy handling those uh, internal uh, issues uh, and, 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 uh, uh, and finance obligations, responsibilities. So it's very busy. So they, they don't have time to outreach, to collaborate, but Joy and I, and together with the core teams, we thought that if we keep doing things like in the past, we just you know, busy doing our own things, then generation after generation will be always doing the same thing over and over. But we all know united, we can do much better and be much stronger. That's why we think the correlation can, can come out and, and, and help and advocate and also you know, share experience and collaboration. So, uh, so part of the uh, attending you know, international conference is to find the connection. So if you know anything, let us know. Yes, yeah, sure. sorry, Joy. Right, right. Oh, and I'll just say that, yes, we do try to make ourselves visible so that schools can um, join us and um, one way is through this America's Languages Initiative, which focuses on community, indigenous, and refugee programs. Um, and this is, we're going to have a, a, a site where schools are documented. I think that's gonna give us visibility. Um, so yeah, we're working, on, we're making as many connections as as we possibly can. And really the main people, Hungarian. Oh, good, Hungarians. Now I can read the chat. So now I'm getting all distracted. Um, but, but what I wanted to say is, as Tommy just said, 
It's really the language representatives who need to do the outreach because they're the ones who are in the community. They're the ones who are in the schools. They're the ones who people want to hear from, who people can connect with and hear from. So thank you for that great question. Thank you for all your great questions. And you know what, Ken? I think we can go on to you. Alex, what do you want to do? Um, I'll remain. Uh, that's that's fine, Ken. Um, it's up to you. I mean, maybe someone would like to have a bit of a break. Yeah. Um, so what we could do is, uh, if that's okay with uh, with Joy and Tommy. Yeah. Okay. Oh sure, yeah. We'll, hey. And then we'll, we'll come back, and I'm going to come back and hear you, Ken. There is a one question that's kind of interesting. Uh, is from NSW okay. Japanese School. In Australia, it is very difficult to get into a heritage class for the children who has a native Japanese parent. What do you think about it? Uh, I'm not sure, get into, mm. so is this a like a regular school class or is community-based school class? Yeah, and maybe, maybe Ken and Alex could answer the question uh, because we don't have this experience. I think it refers to in the in uh, high school, there are different syllabuses for background, heritage, and non-background speakers. And it's actually quite racist the way the students are put into different classes and syllabuses because it doesn't depend on their fluency. So a lot of, um, say, children with one with a Japanese mother, they're called heritage language learners, even if they don't speak a word of Japanese. So the way the government does it is quite, I think, quite racist. The community language schools are a lot mm -hmm. more open in their acceptance of parents and students. I see. Okay. Mm. I and think very I'm right. interesting. I'm Thank right. you. Yeah. Yeah, somebody just agreed with you. And yeah, people are agreeing with you, Ken. <laughs> and saying it's not only Japanese, it's also Chinese, somebody yes. mentioned. Yeah, it's a big oh. problem because the government, some people think that because you have a heritage language, you have an unfair advantage uh, 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 in comparison with students who speak no language. And, and so they try and give students who don't have a language background an advantage in the exams by downgrading those who have a second language. <laughs> don't worry, this is Australia, it's mm. crazy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say the same thing about us. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, how long should we start? Okay, look, um, I'm just gonna change cameras, everybody bear with me. And um, what I'll do is, um, I think Ken uh, and join everybody. Just just to be fair to everybody, if yeah. we can uh, if we can actually start on time as as advertised, because I'm sure okay. that there are people that that did plan their days around uh, attending at that time. So I think okay. um, we will have a bit of a break, and um, and in the meantime, um, uh, I think we'll wrap it up today. So I would again uh, say thank you so much to our to our two international guests and for. Ken, our, our intro to Ken, um, uh, valuable information, great information. There's so much to do. Could I just reiterate that the, the fact that, um, that we've made a connection um, now with, uh, with uh, an organization from abroad, from the United States. Um, for those of you that are attending, please spread the word. If you feel like contacting these uh, associations through Joy and Tommy, I think it's an excellent idea. Go ahead. If you, if you haven't got the emails, just contact me. I've left my email. Um, uh, on the uh, on the chat, uh, you can contact me through the Eventbrite. You've got loads of uh, loads of, way of uh, ways of doing this. So please go ahead, get in touch with other uh, uh, associations, other community groups uh, of same or even other languages if you feel like it. It's an excellent way to get ideas. Remember, people, that what's happening now in the community languages sector here in New South Wales. There are some changes undergoing that's, uh, uh, that that we're undergoing. Um, get the experience from, from those that might have a completely different uh, uh, reality, let's say, uh, such as the ones in the United States. We've all got great ideas. Communicate, connect with other people as much as you can. I think it's, it's, it's one thing that we can get, um, one of the many things that we can get out of uh, this morning's uh, first session. So everybody, 
Thank you. Um, can can I can I say one thing, Alex? Um, I was going to say, oh, do you want me to send you our slides? Do you want to post them somewhere or not? That's, yes, that's something that we would love to have. Uh, yeah. Okay, we'll I'll send them to you. Okay, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's, okay, <laughs> that's fine. Thank that's you fine. for having us. It's wonderful Thank to be with you. you. You guys ask such so, great so questions. Good night to you. Thank Good you. night to you. But and when do we come back now to hear Ken? Um, I'm going to, if you can actually, if everyone can just log off, go have your cup of tea, have your cup of coffee, and uh, I'll still be here um, and uh, everything will be off. And we'll just come back at the, uh, as, as, as established, 10.30, which is about 25 minutes time. Okay. So um, we'll see you all in about 25 minutes. Okay. Sorry for giving you such a long break. I hope that's welcome. That's the way that we so. want. That's okay. <laughs> to do what they've got to do in the okay. morning. Okay, we'll see you soon. I'll, I'll log you all up. Well, see you soon.